Right out of high school, I struggled to find a job. It was back in 2012, roughly, and I was living in a remote part of South Dakota. Short of finding a job working at one of the little mom-and-pop hardware stores, I wouldn't find anything with much promise. Thanks to a family friend, I got lucky enough to land a job in construction. We were paid by the job, not the hour, and despite a frenetic pay schedule, the money was good. I started out like any other newbie. I was the gopher when it came down to lunch, and I would usually go out and grab a bite to eat for the guys who didn't pack. I unloaded the materials off the back of the trucks, and I handled a good portion of the cleanup. You know, grunt work. But in between all of those things, while I had small tidbits of time to kill, I found myself paying close attention to the work being done. Douglas, my boss at the time, took notice, and one day on a new job site, he took me to the side and said we were going to try something different. He told me that he was going to show me how to do it. Douglas was a great boss, he was tough but fair, and took no bull from anyone. But if he likes you, you know, he was ex-military, and never minced words, always telling you the way he saw things. Though he rubbed some people the wrong way, I appreciated the upfront honesty. We met by my old beat-up Ford Ranger shortly before we were going to get started. Douglas handed me a pair of gloves, a pair of safety glasses, and a sledgehammer before asking me if I remembered to grab my construction hat. I told him I did, and he said, Fantastic. Today I'm showing you how to do proper demolition work. I took the equipment from him with a smile on my face. But what about the cleaning materials and lunch run? I asked him. He patted my shoulder and gave me a reassuring nod. Don't worry about it, Kev. I've already got that covered. The new guy should be around here somewhere. Now that I think about it, I should probably find him and give him a quick rundown of what we expect out of him today. Just meet up with the rest of the crew inside and let them know I'll be there for about 10 minutes. I went inside, and the demolition crew was standing there with the homeowner going over their plan of action. I said hi to Randy, Kef, and Tyrone. Jeff stood there with an excited expression on his face as he saw me standing there with the sledgehammer resting on my shoulder. The moment they got done talking to the homeowner, he turned to me and said, Oh man, Douglas put you on demo. Nice. With an extra set of hands, we should get through this pretty quickly. Randy jokingly chimed by saying, That might be the case, but that kid knows how I like my corned beef and Swiss. Who's going to get it for me now? Then he nudged my arm with his elbow. I said, Douglas said to hang on for a few minutes while he talks to the new guy. Then Tyrone chimed in. What new guy? With those words, we all looked up to find that Douglas was walking around with an annoyed expression on his face. He didn't ask much of us, we just had to do our work and watch our language just in case the homeowner happened to be around. You actually had to do quite a bit to incur his wrath, with the exception of one thing. He couldn't stand it when employees were late. Barring a reasonable excuse like a traffic jam or vehicle problems, tardiness was a big no-no on this job, especially on your first day. After a minute, Douglas joined us and started giving us the rundown as far as what he expected us to be able to get done over the next couple of weeks. He wasn't a ball breaker in that aspect, and all he expected from us was to get a fair amount of demo out of the way that day, then try to get it finished within three days. We all agreed that three days to demo two rooms on the wall was more than enough especially with five guys up to the task. As we were getting ready to grab our hammers and get to work, in walks this kid no older than me. He was dressed entirely inappropriately for this job. Tennis shoes, ill-fitting baggy jeans with no belt to speak of, so they were sagging. He was wearing an affliction t-shirt and an expensive looking diesel jacket. He had big cubic zirconia studs in his ears and he was wearing a long thick gold chain. They say first impressions are everything, so when he opened his mouth and spoke those first words, we knew what we were getting into. Damn, Uncle. You got me up at the ass crack of dawn for what? Best believe I'm getting paid for being here. We all looked over at Douglas, and he was white as a sheet, and yet somehow seething with anger. Well, Cameron, you will be getting paid as long as you do your job. Also, thanks for letting it slip that you're my nephew. I wasn't going to tell the boys because I don't want them to feel as if you got this job out of nepotism. You're going to work just as hard as everybody else and you'll get paid when everybody else does at the end of this job. We all looked at each other with this expression that said, damn, then we attempted to introduce ourselves. Cameron stood there like an impudent child with his arms crossed, and it was almost as if he was getting ready to throw a temper tantrum. Fine, Douglas said, with every bit of that morning's frustration oozing onto every word. If that's how you're going to act, 
and the boys are going to know exactly why you're here. Don't think I'm going to fire you because you want to act as entitled as you think you are. You're going to work, plain and simple. Douglas enlightened us to the fact that Cameron was working this job because his mother was sick of everything he was putting her through. She asked him to get a job when he turned 18, and instead he sat around all day playing Halo. Then one day, his 17-year-old girlfriend showed up at the house with a positive pregnancy test. A later test of the doctors would confirm that she was in fact expecting Cameron's child, yet this still didn't light a fire under his ass. He still carried on like usual and expected his mom to foot the bill. When she vented to her brother, he absolutely lost it. He took it upon himself to teach his nephew about responsibility. As admirable as this was, Cameron was ridiculously hard to work with. The way he showed up dressed on the first day was our first indicator as to what we were getting into. Douglas was able to get through to him just a smidge on that day, and when he came back on day number two, he left the expensive clothing and jewelry at home. He went to Walmart and bought himself a pair of inexpensive work boots with steel toes and kept his head down. But that was only because of the fact that his uncle made him do those things. Despite Cameron's foot dragging and his constant need to be corrected, we managed to get the job done a week ahead of schedule. This was not uncommon because we were a cohesive unit and even with a squeaky gear, this is how we rolled. All of us saw a pretty nice payday at that job. I got a raise, but when Cameron got his check, which was far more generous than anything he deserved, he proceeded to act like a man-child and throw a tantrum. If you pick up your feet and actually do some work without us having to stop and show you the right way and the safe way to do it multiple times, I would have thrown a little extra in there. But that's a few grand. Stop complaining, Douglas said to him with a bit of admonishment in his voice. We watched as Cameron said nothing and went to his little beat-up Ford Ranger, then peeled out. Douglas just shook his head. He couldn't believe his nephew's audacity. He was honestly tempted to not tell him about the next job, but with a child on the way, he couldn't do that in good conscience. So a few weeks later, he begrudgingly told Cameron to meet us at this address right by a beautiful lake. We arrived at the house. It was nice, but a definite fixer-upper. The person who owned it was a nice older gentleman. He was a widower, if I remember correctly, and he decided to spend his remaining days on the water. The interior of the house was dated, Floral wallpaper that was peeling in some sections, or altogether missing in others. The hardwood floors had seen better days, not rotten but dirty and scuffed. However, his prime concern was the roof. There were a couple of areas that were starting to dip due to wood rot and moisture damage. He had a building inspector come by before purchasing the property. They confirmed that despite the condition of the roof, the remainder of the building was structurally sound and therefore safe to move into but he wanted to make sure he got a trustworthy contractor to take care of the biggest problem areas first. Cameron showed up late as usual, and he didn't even join us for the walkthrough and planning portion of the job. He just stood by his truck wearing a pair of sunglasses that would have made Kurt Cobain jealous, and truthfully, he seemed kind of out of it. Randy and Tyrone were the first ones to notice and pointed out to me. Huh, guess he's got a hangover or something, Randy remarked. Nah, I don't know about all that. I got suspicions, but I can't prove anything. Let's just tell Douglas to keep an eye on him, because something's definitely off. Tyrone separated from us as subtly as he could, and we saw him take Douglas to the side. He quietly said something to him. Douglas kind of side-eyed his nephew and nodded at Tyrone before asking us to go ahead and set up. Cameron eventually joined us, walking sluggishly towards the job site. He had this uncharacteristically happy smile on his face. At first we were thinking maybe he just wasn't awake, we didn't see the usual large can of monster energy drink in his hand, so maybe he just didn't have enough time to stop off and get one. We informed him that we were going to be ripping the shingles off of the roof. All he had to do was stay near the dumpster in case anything missed the slide, which was aimed directly at it. He would just have to pick up anything that hit the ground. He shrugged and nodded as if he understood what we said, and we went to it. If you remember, I did mention that one of the biggest problems was that he had to have things explained to him multiple times. That was either because he wasn't doing it right, doing it safely, or a combination of both. We looked down to see what kind of progress he was making, and we noticed that he was throwing around chunks of asphalt shingle like a ninja throwing shurikens. A few of them ricocheted off of the dumpster and landed on the roof, almost hitting Randy and Jeff. One whizzed past my head, and I was at the roof's apex. This meant he was down on the ground goofing off with no regard for anyone's safety. 
Douglas climbed down the 25-foot extension ladder that we had propped up as a way up and down. He made his way over to his nephew and told him to use the shovel on the ground to scoop the shingles up rather than continue to throw them and almost injure somebody. That's when the Cameron we all knew and loathed reared his damn head. He picked up the shovel in a huff and started throwing the shingles into the dumpster all willy-nilly. Yes, the job was finally getting done as close to the correct way as possible, but he was making more work for himself, for what? To make a point. To borrow a pro wrestling term, he was getting gassed, huffing and puffing, red in the face, absolutely exhausted because he wanted to be an overgrown kindergartner. Professionalism is important in these types of jobs. You never know if the homeowner is on site, and as luck sometimes has it, the homeowner decided to show up with some pizzas as a way to say thank you. He was just trying to make it so we didn't have to try a fast food joint in an otherwise unfamiliar area. The gentleman put the pizza boxes down, and we saw Cameron throw the shovel down and immediately rush over to the food. He grabbed a slice and started downing it before Tyrone had enough. Yo man, we got another 20 minutes before lunch. You could be doing your job, but instead you leave us hanging for what? Some pepperoni? You ain't been right since you got here. What gives? Are you hungover or something? Cameron took a giant bite of his pizza slice, and with a full mouth just said, I'm something. He swallowed his food and started laughing. I'll tell you later, he added. From what I was later to hear from Tyrone, there was a sinister and snide tone to that response. It didn't sit well with him, and deep down, he knew he didn't want an answer to that question. After all, he was just trying to talk sense into the kid, but how do you do that with somebody so senseless? We continued working as Cameron worked on a second slice, and by then we were so fed up that we just figured we would let him do it. If he had to stay after a bit longer than everybody else to finish his cleanup job, it was on him. We finished peeling the shingles off of the first half of the roof, and Douglas told us to go down and get a bite to eat. Jeff said he had to take care of a couple of things before he came down, but eventually he joined up with us. The homeowner being the guy he was, thought ahead. Like I previously mentioned, we were right there by the water, the day was particularly humid, and we were up on this guy's roof with little to no coverage. We were right in the sweltering sun. This kind gentleman not only grabbed pizzas for us to eat, he picked up a large container of Lipton iced tea. He stuck them in his little stand-up deep freezer, just long enough for ice crystals to form on the liquid surface. These were perfect, not frozen solid, but just cold enough to be perfectly refreshing. We were all standing there eating our lunch inside and downing the much needed iced tea. That was when Jeff jabbed at his elbow and asked, What is that? We looked around and realized that Cameron was nowhere around us, and the sound that Jeff was pointing out was the sound of his air compressor turning on again. He told me that he unplugged it and took the hose out of his nail gun. Sweet Jesus, he better not be up there screwing with that, Jeff said out loud. Partway through the day, the safety guard on Jeff's admittedly older nail gun broke and he had to remove it. The thing was still firing nails, but now there was nothing to stop them in the case of a malfunction. Knowing what I now know, Cameron must have been listening in when Jeff warned us to stay away from him while he was using it, just in case anything went south. We went outside and heard the familiar pop-pop of a nail gun firing off nails. Jeff had to replace the section of the roof that was starting to dip inward, and he proceeded to get that out of the way once we got that area de-shingled. Jeff was freaking out thinking that he was up there shooting nails into the section of roof he just repaired. Then we realized that what he was actually doing was far worse. We were making our way over to the ladder when we saw a bird fall out of the sky and struggle as if it was taking its last breaths. It had a finishing nail sticking out of its side. This clown was up there shooting birds with a nail gun. What I did next was something that I have come to regret for a while. I was closer to the ladder, and I decided to climb up to the roof to see if I could stop Cameron from being an idiot. I reached the top, and as I was about waist high to the roof, Cameron was sitting there with the nail gun pointed in my direction. He had a confused look on his face, but that look of confusion turned to one of malice. As I was getting ready to go up a couple more rungs and put my foot up on the roof, I remember hearing the pop. I felt weightlessness, and then everything suddenly went black. The next thing I remember is waking up in a hospital room. I would later find out that I'd been out for a few days in a medically induced coma. I fell 25 feet straight down, thankfully into a bush next to the house, but only partially. The bush broke my fall just enough to save my life, but I suffered a concussion and a shattered shoulder blade, but that wasn't the worst of it. 
I realized it hurt for me to talk. It hurt really bad. I found out that when he fired off that nail gun, he gave me a makeshift tracheotomy. The doctors let me know that the nail was lodged in my throat, and had he been any closer, I more than likely would have been paraplegic. I would spend two weeks in the hospital before my insurance would stop paying for the stay. Luckily, they covered my subsequent physical therapy. So here I am, not even in my 20s, and I now have nagging back pain due to the fact that my shoulder blade had to be loaded up with Kirchner wires and rebuilt. My voice is forever changed because the nail damaged my vocal cords. I went from having a somewhat normal voice to sounding like I smoke a pack a day. As I was in the hospital healing up, Douglas and Tyrone came to check in on me and we had a long conversation. I asked him what happened to Cameron and told him I planned on taking him to court. He told me that I'm not the only one, but then he told me not to hold my breath. After I fell off the ladder, apparently he got off that roof as quickly as possible. Then he ran straight past me into his truck. He sped off, and that was the last time his uncle saw him. Later on in the day, he got in a phone call from his sister, Cameron's mother. She asked him to put Cameron on the phone. Before Douglas could say anything about the situation that unfolded, she told Douglas something disturbing. She'd been putting laundry in his room and found an empty bottle of Vicodin that was prescribed to somebody else. It was sitting on top of his dresser. It was only then that Douglas was able to tell his sister what happened. She was absolutely horrified. He told her that he was going to call his cell phone and reason with him, but there was no reasoning with this kid. He continued to tell me how the rest of the day went. For several hours, he attempted to call Cameron only for the calls to go straight to voicemail. Finally, after what felt like the hundredth attempt, Cameron picked up. He started out the conversation by telling his uncle, Good luck finding me. Douglas attempted to reason with him by telling him to turn around because he was abandoning his child. He told him that he had to do right because he put me in the hospital, damn near killing me. Douglas was then left in a state of shock by the last thing Cameron told him before going permanently radio silent. At first he let out that typical indignant laugh, followed up by, What kid? Then he said, Yeah, I know my mom found the pills. She left me several voicemails detailing it. I was celebrating. I was actually trying to get fired that day because I knew you wouldn't let me quit. As far as Kevin goes, he was too stupid to stay off of that ladder. That injury is on him. He lived through it. Great. But I'm not sticking around to catch charges either way. This is the last time any of you will be able to get in contact with me. I'm not coming back, and I'm not keeping this phone number. Bye. And with that, he hung up on his uncle, never to be heard from again. To this day, I don't know what happened to Cameron. What I do know is that I went through two months worth of physical therapy before our lovely healthcare system opted to stop paying for it. To this day, I can't lift my right arm above chest level without excruciating pain. As far as typing is concerned, I can do it in short bursts before my arms feel like they're going to give out. Thank God for dictation software and speech to text, which I'm currently using to write out my story. I'm pissed because I got no justice in the situation. This absolute waste of skin cost me my mobility, my passion for carpentry, and almost cost me my life. And now he's just out there somewhere, more than likely making life miserable for somebody else. I tried and failed to get disability. I had no money coming in, and unlike Cameron, I wasn't comfortable living with my parents past the age of 18. I really wanted to do something with my life. I finally got a chance to move away from home when I was 23. I found a job working in administration, and thankfully, it has minimal typing. My boss knows my story and understands my situation, so she tries to keep it as easy going for me as possible. The pay is alright, it's enough to survive, not really enough to live. It was enough for me to build up my credit over a couple of years, and I managed to find an affordable mortgage on a little two-bedroom rancher that was in itself a fixer-upper. Occasionally I walk around and see the little things that need to be repaired, and it kills me that I can't do it myself. Slowly but surely it's coming together, but I have to hire people to do it, despite the knowledge I picked up working that job. I still talk to the guys occasionally. Tyrone and Jeff have been kind enough to put time aside and help me with some of the repairs usually out of their own pockets. However, they too are family men, and I honestly feel guilty when they do these repairs for me free of charge. I'm taking food off of their tables when they do that, and that's not how I was raised. Still, they're good friends, and they won't take no for an answer, but Cameron is on that short list of people I can honestly say that I truly hate. Douglas held on to the guilt around my situation for a while. 
He told me time and time again that he should have fired his nephew the first day he showed up late. None of us had any inclination that he would be so careless and show such a serious amount of disregard for other people's safety. I was never mad at Douglas. That piece of crap had him fooled into thinking he was just irresponsible and needed a kick in the pants, a push in the right direction. His uncle had no idea what he really needed was a padded cell. And before anybody asks, no, I didn't attempt to take Douglas to court. I'm not going to. I would be drowning in far more medical bill debt had he not taken the step most contractors don't. He made sure all of us were insured. It's thanks to him that I could get those bills at the very least partially paid. Any other financial headaches from that point came from the insurance company and not him. But he never stopped stressing out about the fact he hired such a monster. It eventually led to him having a stroke. Though he lived through it, he has almost no use of his left side to this day. He's bound to a wheelchair, and I 100% blame his nephew. So before I finish up here, I just want to put this out there. If you happen to get a job working for an independent contractor, and a 5 foot 10 spindly Caucasian guy with ginger hair and an Eminem wannabe haircut shows up on your site, ask him if his name is Cameron. If he says yes, ask him if he lived near the town of Deadwood in South Dakota. If he does, there are some people who want to have a serious discussion with him. My name is Andrew, and I am a 47-year-old single father. My daughter's name is Celia, and she just turned 25, but this happened when she was young. I think she was 7 years old. After my divorce, we moved to a new city and stayed with my brother at first. The transition was tough, of course, but it wasn't long before we got on our feet. I took a sales job at an electronics store to start, but I was always applying for other things. Eventually, I saw an ad on LinkedIn for a position in tech sales. The pay was way more than I had ever made, so I didn't think I would get it, but I applied anyway. To my surprise, I got an interview. It was one of those modern offices, kind of Google style. There were a lot of perks like free food and everything, but I just wanted to support my family and get our own place. The interview went well, and I was actually hired. I honestly couldn't believe my own luck. As long as I could hold this job down, I would be able to afford a good place in no time, and my daughter would have a place to call home. The stakes were high, so I was determined not to screw things up. The company had a three-month probationary period, where they could fire me for any reason. Whether I wasn't making sales or somebody simply didn't like me, I could be out of there just like that. On my first day, I was sure to be extra friendly with everyone, just to make sure I made a good first impression. That was when I met John for the first time. He was not my direct boss, but he was one of the senior sales guys. It was his job to show me around and bring me up to speed. John was a few years older than me. He was tall and thin with really bad posture and a bushy mustache. He wore thick glasses and suspenders every day, but I think it was kind of in an ironic way, sort of like a hipster. I didn't know if I liked him right away. Actually, I didn't even care. All that mattered was making sure this job worked out, so I was following John around and doing my best to keep up. After the first few days, I was pretty much on my own. The office had an open layout, and the sales area was a small section of the office where about 15 of us worked. After my first month, I had just barely made my sales quota, meaning that I was safe for the time being. To add to it, I was getting along with everyone well. John was still around, and we talked most days, but I was getting the idea that he was not very popular around the office. I noticed other people avoiding him, but I never bothered to ask anyone what was up with him. One day when I was at my desk, John came over to me and invited me out for drinks with some of the others. I agreed to go because I thought it would be an important way to bond with everyone. I was planning to pick Celia up from school as usual, but my sister-in-law was able to do it, so I was free. After work, when I went to meet up with everyone, John was the only one there. He was waiting for me out on the street alone. I asked where everyone else was, but he said that they cancelled. I was already feeling some regret because I could have gone home instead. Not wanting to offend him, I agreed to go out anyway though. We went to a bar that was nearby and ordered some drinks and food. We were making small talk and I told him about my whole situation. I was still living with my brother, so we talked about that for a bit. When the topic of my daughter came up, John made some awkward and inappropriate jokes about young girls, and I was extremely put off. I didn't want to sit there with him anymore, but I still didn't want to burn the bridge. I decided to make up an excuse and get out of there but what I really wanted to do was punch him in the face. I paid my bill and left, then went back home. 
Celia was there with my sister-in-law, and they were playing board games. I joined in, then put Celia to bed soon after. Weeks went by, and I was still doing well. It was looking good for me at the company, and my probation period was getting nearer every day. I was trying to ignore John, but he was always there. He didn't try to talk to me either, and I am pretty sure he got the hint that I didn't like him. One day I was at the park with my daughter, and I saw John walk by from a distance. I was hoping he wouldn't see us, so I just ignored it. I was sitting on a bench while Celia was playing with some other kid that was there. Out of nowhere, I noticed John approaching from a distance. He came right up to me and started talking. I kept things light and tried to be pleasant, but it really creeped me out every time he looked over to the kids. I managed to get out of it and took Celia home. I talked to Celia that night, reminding her not to talk to strangers and to always stay close to me when we were out. I didn't mention John specifically, but I was starting to worry. About a month later, things took a turn. It was late at night, around midnight, and Celia was asleep along with the others. I was downstairs, finishing up some paperwork at the kitchen table, when I heard a noise outside. At first I thought it might be nothing, but then I heard it again, this time closer, like it was coming from near the side of the house. I got up and quietly went to check. As I approached the front door, I saw a shadow moving near one of the windows. My heart raced as I realized someone was trying to get in. I moved towards the back door where the noise was coming from. When I got closer, I saw John's face through the window. He was trying to force it open, clearly aiming to get inside. He hadn't noticed me yet, so I quickly unlocked the back door and yanked it open. John froze when he saw me. He was caught red-handed. I didn't yell, but my voice was firm when I asked him what the hell he was doing. He stammered something about needing to talk, but I wasn't buying it. Celia was upstairs, and the thought of him getting anywhere near her made my skin crawl. I told him to leave, and that if I ever saw him near my house again, I'd call the police. He knew I meant it, and without another word, he took off down the street. My three months at the company was coming up soon, but I just couldn't wait. I brought the incidents up with my supervisor privately, and as soon as I finished, she urged me to report it to the police. I did as she said, and John was arrested that day. After that, I found out that I was not the only one who had issues with him. There have been many complaints leading up to this, but they were all minor issues, nothing like what I went through. Everyone seemed to appreciate me speaking out against that creep. I managed to keep the job, and I was able to get our own place for me and my daughter. I worked for that company for almost 10 years before finding something else, and I never heard from John again. When I was in my late 20s, I worked security at an apartment building. It wasn't the most exciting job, but it was easy. One of the guys I worked with was Todd. He was younger than me, a small quiet guy who kept to himself. We got along well enough, but we didn't talk much. To be honest, I didn't really enjoy working with him. The other guys were more fun, and the shifts went by quicker when they were around. With Todd, it was basically like working alone, but I would use that time to read, so it wasn't all bad. I was pretty sure that Todd was into hard drugs, because he had the look. He never showed up high or made it obvious, so that was just my suspicion. One night, I was stuck on a shift with Todd. It was just past midnight, and things were quiet, as usual. I had brought my gym bag with me that night, because I'd been working out earlier. In the bag, I had some important stuff like my passport, social security card, keys, and some cash. I had to go to the bank that day, so I didn't want to leave it at home. We were sitting in the security office together. I was reading a book, trying to pass the time, while Todd was on his phone. After a while, I got up to use the bathroom. When I came back, something didn't feel right. My bag looked like it had been moved. I tried to tell myself that I was probably just imagining things, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. I unzipped my bag and started going through it. Most of my stuff seemed to be there, but when I reached into the side pocket, I realized my keys were missing. My first thought was Todd. It was just the two of us in the office, and he was the only one who could have touched my bag while I was gone. I tried to stay calm and casual as I asked Todd if he had seen my keys. He barely looked up from his phone and just said no. His response was so quick and dismissive that it made me doubt myself for a moment. Maybe I had left them at the gym earlier. I also thought that if he was going to steal anything, then he would have at least gone for the cash, but it was still there, so it seemed that I might have lost them on my own. 
I texted my roommate to make sure he was home, just in case I couldn't find them. He replied right away, letting me know he'd be there until morning when I would be back. That gave me some peace of mind, because at least I knew that I wouldn't be locked out. Since it was the middle of the night, I couldn't call the gym to check, so there really wasn't anything I could do. The rest of the night went by, and at 6 in the morning, I was off. The sun was coming out as I walked to the bus stop, and I was home by around 6.45. We had an apartment in an old house on the ground floor, and when I got close, I could see my roommate through the front window. I went inside, just as he was heading out for work. Right after he left, I locked all the doors before collapsing onto my bed. The late night shifts were still tough for me, because I only did a few of them each week, and my body was not that used to it. It was around 10 a.m. when I was woken up by the sound of footsteps and voices in my apartment. I tossed and turned for a while, but I still didn't think anything was wrong. I thought it could be my roommate coming back for lunch, but it didn't sound like him, and there were clearly multiple people. I was still groggy, but I knew something was very wrong. I got out of bed as quietly as I could, and crept toward the noise. When I peeked out from my bedroom, I saw three men in masks going through my stuff. One of them saw me and shouted something to the others. I barely had time to react before they rushed toward me. That's when I recognized Todd, even with the mask. He was smaller than the others, and it was pretty obvious by the way he looked. I knew it was him, there was no doubt in my mind. The moment Todd saw that I recognized him, he seemed to panic. They were still coming towards me though, and I was scared that they were going to beat the crap out of me or maybe worse. One of the men shoved me back into the bedroom, yelling at me to stay in there. Todd was right behind him, avoiding eye contact. I could tell he was nervous, maybe even regretting what he'd done, but it was too late for that now. They had already torn the place apart. I ran over to my phone and unplugged it from the charger on my nightstand. It was at half power, so more than enough. While this was happening, I could hear the intruders rushing out the front door. I didn't hear it, but I assumed that Todd had told them that I recognized him. They would have known that there wasn't much time before the cops got there. I proceeded to call the police, and they sent someone over, but by then, everyone was gone. Some stuff was stolen, but mostly from my roommate. They got his laptop and some other stuff, but the creepiest thing happened when I was going through the apartment later in the day. The police had left, and I was doing my best to get the place looking decent for when my roommate got home. I had moved the couch in order to sweep up some broken glass, and as soon as I shoved it out of place, I saw my keys lying there on the floor. That little weasel Todd left them there, so he could deny taking them. I can just imagine that jerk denying it, and asking if I checked under the couch. I reported that to the police too. They did arrest Todd that day, and he confessed to the cops. He also ratted out his friends that helped him. If anything good came out of this whole thing, it was that I never had to work with that kid again.